In our microbiology class, we're now ready to move into Chapter 14, where we'll be studying the principles of disease and epidemiology section. Chapter 14 is full of terminology that is essential for you to master and use in the remainder of the course. We start Chapter 14 by learning the term pathology. A pathology is the scientific study of disease. Every time we talk about the pathology, the study of a disease, we break this down into three parts that you're required to know. So as we get a little further in the semester, we are going to begin learning about different diseases. And it is going to be up to you to realize you need to know these three things, the pathology of every disease that we cover. The three components of pathology are first the etiology. This is the cause of the disease. In our class, since this is microbiology, our etiology is always going to be the name of the microbe that is responsible for causing the disease. So if we use something like um, the disease tetanus, for example, the etiology of tetanus is Clostridium tetani. That is the name of the bacteria itself that you must have in your body that will cause you to end up with the disease tetanus. The second part of pathology is called the pathogenesis. This is the way the disease develops in your body. In the pathogenesis, you're going to discuss things like how do you acquire the infection. Once the infection or the microbe gets into your body, where does it go? Those are the sorts of things that occur in pathogenesis. Using our same tetanus example, you, the pathogenesis of tetanus begins with the um, protrusion of your skin with the endospore of Clostridium tetani. Once the spore is in your body, the bacteria begins to live inside of your body. The bacteria then moves to your nerve endings where it causes structural and functional, change, functional changes to your body, the third part of the pathology. With tetanus, the changes that is brought, are brought to your body would be things like um, locked jaw, uncontrollable jerking, possibly eventual paralysis, different things of that nature. Another important set of terms we need to understand as we go through this section is the difference between an infection and a disease. An infection is the entry of pathogenic microbes into your body. Whenever you get any pathogen into your body, that is a microbe that can make you sick, you are considered to have an infection. You have an infection whether you can feel any signs or symptoms of the microbes being in your body. If they are present, it is an infection. Once the pathogenic microbes that have entered your body begin to change your state of normal health, it is considered a disease. Most of us think of the word disease as a, something devastating. If I came in and told you I had a disease, you would think that something was really seriously wrong with me. But using the terminology properly, even the common cold is a disease. You get the infection when the virus gets into your nasal cavity. That's already an infection. It becomes a disease when you start to have changes in your body because the virus has entered. Uh, for example, you may start sneezing or coughing or having a runny nose. That technically is a disease because it has changed your normal body state. An important term that you need to consider as we complete the micro course is the term normal microbiota. Normal microbiota are the microbes that are present on and in your body at all times. The normal microbiota do not cause disease unless something else causes changes in your body. Then the normal microbiota may become an opportunistic infection. Every person listening to this audio right now has a body that is covered inside and out with bacterial cells and some fungal cells. It is estimated that every adult human maintains at least 1 times 10 to the 14th bacterial cells on and in their body at all times. You need these microbes on you. The only time in your life you have ever been free of microbes is when you were living in your mother's womb. The moment you began the birth process to leave your mother's body, you received your first normal microbiota. 
Most babies get their first normal microbiota as they exit the birth canal. They pick up a lactobacilli, typically from the vagina of the mother. If they are born by C-section or some other means, they're still going to pick up normal microbiota. The first time you eat, the first time you breathe, you begin to establish the microbes that are supposed to live on you. The normal microbiota are a very good thing. Think about it this way. Only so many people can fit into a room. If you fill that room with good people, then there's not any room for any bad people to be around. This is what we do with the normal microbiota on our body. We keep good bacteria that do not harm us under normal conditions in high enough numbers that if a bad bacteria does happen upon us, it's less likely that the pathogen will be able to infect us. Now this page just gives you a list of some of the common names of the normal microbiota. You'll find them different places of the body. I would never expect you to memorize something like this, but I just wanted to point a few of the names out to you. Your skin and eyes, as you can see, are covered with bacteria as well as some yeast. Candida, Malaysia, these are yeast. And you can see some of the things you think are horrific bacteria, such as Staphylococcus aureus. It's everywhere. You have Staphylococcus on your skin, your eyes, into your respiratory tract, in your mouth, and so on and so forth. Your body is full of bacteria. You can see some of these are the bacteria that we use in lab. Why would we use normal microbiota in lab? Because it's less likely to make you sick. You all already have it anyway. Now moving a little bit further into how this normal microbiota interacts with us as the host, we need to look at the term microbial antagonism. Antagonism is when the growth of the good bacteria prevents the growth of any harmful bacteria. Just to give you a few examples that most people would be able to relate to, let's go through the example of the lactobacillus and candida albicans antagonistic relationship that occurs in the female vagina. In this region, the, we have both bacteria, lactobacillus, and yeast, candida. As long as we are in a normal healthy state, both of them live to a certain concentration to keep one from outgrowing the other. Let's say now I get a sinus infection. I now am taking an antibiotic. Antibiotics kill bacteria. Not only is that antibiotic going to kill the bad bacteria I'm trying to get rid of out of my sinuses, but that antibiotic is also going to start killing some of my good bacteria. And many women can relate to the fact that once you start taking an antibiotic, a lot of times a yeast infection occurs. What is happening is that the antibiotic you are taking is killing off this good bacteria, the lactobacillus, allowing the yeast to grow in higher quantities than they're supposed to. And that's how you get a yeast infection. Antagonistic relationships are not the only types of relationships we see between the body, the host, as and microbes. There are three types of symbiotic relationships. There are commensal relationships in which one organism benefits while the other is unaffected. There are mutualistic relationships in which both organisms in the symbiotic relationship benefit. And then there are parasitic relationships in which one organism benefits while harming the other. There are really are no good examples of commensal relationships in the microbiology world as far as with humans, but there are many examples of mutualistic and parasitic relationships. An example of a mutualistic relationship is between E. coli and humans. E. coli live in our intestines. And they help us make things like vitamin B and vitamin K. So that's a good thing they do for us. What do we do for the E. coli? We give them a place to live that has a constant supply of nutrition flowing through. Parasitic relationships are the relationships in which the parasite enters our body and harms our body. I've already used this term a little bit already, but let's elaborate a little bit more. Opportunistic microbes are microbes that belong to the normal microbiota of our body, but they begin to grow out of control when the opportunity arises. The best example of this would be the infections we see in AIDS patients. 
AIDS patients are marked by a decreased immunity. When their immune system decreases, the normal microbiota that is on everyone else begins to attack them. And a lot of times with the AIDS patients, you will see lots of fungal infections and different things like that that a normal, healthy person is not going to have to interact with. Moving along, now we're going to look at some different ways to classify our infectious diseases. One thing we do when we are discussing infectious diseases is compare the difference between symptoms, signs, and a syndrome. A symptom is any change in a body function or body state that you as the sufferer can feel, but no one else can observe. An example of that would be a headache or pain. If I looked at you and told you that my arm hurt, you have no evidence that my arm truly hurts or that my head hurts. That is just something I can feel. A sign is going to be something that not only the person affected by the sign can see, but other people, an observer, would be able to see. Something of this nature would be swelling or redness. You can look at somebody and tell if they are swollen or if they have a big sore on their arm. That's a sign. A syndrome is the collection of symptoms and signs that we always see when we are looking at a particular disease. So let's take an example, something like uh, the flu, influenza. If you have the flu, what symptoms would you have? Fatigue, possibly some pain. Okay, Those are going to be symptoms. You're going to have fever, sweats, chills. Those are going to be signs. All of those linked together are considered the syndrome of the flu. We can also classify our infectious diseases as communicable, contagious, or non-communicable. A communicable disease is a disease that spreads from one host to another, whether it be directly or indirectly. Examples I have on the slide are things like chickenpox. If one person has chickenpox, all they have to do is be near someone, breathe on them, and that other person can get chickenpox. Genital herpes, that is spread by sexual contact from one person to another. So that is a communicable disease. A contagious disease is a communicable disease that is very easily spread from one person to another. For a disease to be contagious, it almost has to be guaranteed that if you are near someone that has it, you are going to get it. So something like chickenpox is considered a contagious disease, very easily spread. But notice genital herpes is not a contagious disease. You could possibly have sex with someone that has genital herpes and not get the disease. There's a chance because it is communicable, but there's no guarantee that you will get that disease. A non-communicable disease is a disease that you cannot get from another person. An example there would be tetanus. It doesn't matter if I have tetanus and you're around me. You cannot get it from me. You can only get tetanus from getting an endospore out of the dirt injected into your skin, like stepping on a piece of glass or a rusty nail, something like that. You cannot get it from another person. That's what makes it non-communicable. Now let's go a little further and let's classify our infectious diseases based off of how often they occur. We use two terms to help us do this, and these terms are incidence and prevalence. The incidence of a disease is the number of people in a population who are newly infected with a disease. So when you have an outbreak of a disease, you end up with a high incidence. You have a whole bunch of new cases. That means that's a problem. The prevalence of a disease is the number of people in the population that pretty much have the disease during some given time. So something like HIV, that's a disease that is always in our population. So it has a certain number that's the prevalence. If the prevalence, let's say, is 150, and then the next month we check it, it's 150. And the next month we check it, it's still 150. That's just showing us it's always present in our population. What would worry us is if all of a sudden the prevalence was 150 
and the incidence maybe goes from 10 to 50. That means we've seen a huge increase in the number of people that are, have a new outbreak of the disease. We compare these two numbers together to help us determine if an infectious disease is sporadic, endemic, epidemic, or pandemic. A sporadic disease is a disease that kind of occurs randomly or occasionally with, within an area. These are diseases that we don't typically worry about too much because they're very rare. An endemic disease is a disease that's always present, something like the cold common cold. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of the winter or the middle of the summer or where you are on earth, you can get a cold. It's just kind of always there. An epidemic is when a relatively large population of people within a specific area develop a disease within a short, certain short period of time. An example of an epidemic would be the flu. We don't get flu shots year round because we only see epidemics or outbreaks of the flu during flu season, from about November to February. That's flu season. A pandemic is what we have when the epidemic spreads from one specific defined area into a larger, more worldwide area. So let's take a minute to think of how we can use the terms incidence and prevalence to help us decide where we need to classify these diseases. If we have a low prevalence and a low incidence, probably going to be a sporadic disease. If we have a low incidence and a moderate prevalence, that's going to be an endemic. It's just kind of always there, but we don't see lots of new cases. An epidemic is going to have a huge incidence because within a period of time, you're going to see a large number of new cases. A pandemic is going to also have a large incidence it's just going to cover a larger population area. Another way we can classify infectious diseases is by looking at how severe or how long the disease lasts. An acute disease is a disease you get very quickly, you have some signs and symptoms, and then it goes away. We looked at this some when we were looking at Chapter 13 discussing the flu. We saw this last time when we were in Chapter 13 as well. A latent disease is one that after you have the acute infection, the virus or the pathogen can remain in your body undetected for a while, and then you have another active outbreak of the infection. The two terms that are new to us in this chapter are chronic disease and subacute. A chronic disease is a disease that you develop slowly over time, your body may be a little resistant to it at first, but as time goes on and on, the symptoms are going to get a little bit worse, or they may even start to get a little better, but they're going to last for a long period of time. Examples of this would be things like mono or hepatitis B. Once you get them, you never really get rid of them. Even if you get better and you don't have really any signs or symptoms, you've still got it, and it is slowly having a long-lasting effect on your body. We can classify our infectious diseases yet another way by how they damage the host. A local infection occurs when invading microbes are localized into one specific area. An example of this would be something like a pimple. When you get a pimple or a boil, you are going to have or you're going to have just pathogens in that one area. It is localized. A disease or an infection can become systemic when the microbes or their products are not just in one little local area, but instead move into the bloodstream and then have access to your entire body. A focal infection is an infection in which it started local and then it moved from local, so we get focal from that, it moves from local into your bloodstream, then goes to a new area and makes a new localized infection. The best example of this is the number one cause of endocarditis in the world. The number one cause of endocarditis or heart disease in the world is bacteria from your teeth. Cavities or dental caries 
are considered local infections in your teeth. If they are not taken care of in a timely manner, that bacteria can leave the local infection of the cavity, go into your bloodstream, travel to your heart, and then start causing a new local infection in your heart. Once a bacteria or any pathogen has moved into the blood, we can see sepsis. Sepsis is an inflammatory condition as that is a way of your body responding to having these unwanted pathogens in the blood. We consider someone to become septic when the pathogens are not only in their blood, but they're beginning to multiply. Someone with bacteremia has bacteria in the blood. Somebody with viremia has viruses in their blood. A primary infection versus a secondary infection occurs when you get your first infection that makes you sick. That's your primary infection. A secondary infection can sometimes happen because your body is weakened due to the primary infection. And we've already been talking about this some when we were discussing how normal microbiota can turn around and become an opportunistic or secondary infection. Our next slide breaks a disease down into the different stages that occur. We're going to have five stages of disease. The first stage of disease is considered the incubation period. The incubation period is when you have a small number of microbes in your body. If you notice the graph, our y-axis is, in, is increasing number of microbes and our x-axis is increasing time. So as we begin with this disease, the initial infection, the incubation period, is when the microbes are really trying to grow. You have a small number of microbes. This is the scary part. During the incubation period, you have absolutely no signs or symptoms that anything is wrong with you. After the microbes continue to increase in number, you leave the incubation period and you go into the prodromal period. During the prodromal period, you may start to feel bad, but usually not bad enough that you're going to stay in bed and make sure you're not infecting other people. As the disease continues, you leave the prodromal period and you move into the period of illness when you feel the worst. This is when you have the most pathogens in your body. And then eventually your immune system begins to win and you go into the period of decline. During both of these stages, you're going to have fairly intense signs and symptoms, but they start to get better towards the end of the period of decline. In the period of convalescence, the last stage, this is when you start to feel better, you get completely back to normal. The last bullet on this slide is probably the most important thing you need to bring home with you from this slide. You are capable of transmitting or passing a disease from yourself to someone else during any of these stages. So that means if I get the flu, I can actually spread it to other people during the incubation period when I have absolutely no idea that I have the flu. You're much more likely to spread it once the number of viruses in your body gets higher, but even during the prodromal period, most people are not going to take off work or stay home from school, and you can be in spreading those infections. A reservoir of inf an infection is something living or non-living that provides a place for the pathogen to live while it's waiting for the opportunity to be transmitted to another person or animal to make them sick. One of the most common reservoirs are humans. Humans can be the houses or sites for infections, and they can then turn around and give that infection to another human. An example of this would be HIV, hepatitis, gonorrhea. You can only get that from another human, so it has to live in a human. The second common reservoir is an animal. Very often animals are the houses for diseases. The animal carries the disease until it can be transmitted to us. These diseases can be transmitted to us from the animal many different ways. We can uh, direct bite from the animal can give you rabies. Contact with animal waste can give you something like giardia. Um, 
contaminated food or water or animal products can give you things like tapeworms. Insect bites can give you things like uh, West Nile virus. All those are diseases that are living in the animal, but they're then transmitted to you. The third reservoir is considered non-living. Non-living reservoirs are things like the dirt or water. We've used this as an example many times today. Tetanus is an infection. You get it from the dirt. To give you a slightly different example, something like cholera, Vibrio cholerae, it lives in water. So if you drink dirty water, you can get cholera. There are three common methods in which diseases are transmitted. Whether they're transmitted from any of those types of reservoirs to another, they have to be transmitted by one of these means. The first type of transmission is by contact, second is vehicle, and third is vector. Contact transmission is going to involve animal to human or human to animal contact. Contact transmission can occur through direct contact in which you must have physical interaction between one person or one animal and another. Indirect contact is when you transmit from a reservoir to something that is living through an inanimate or non-living object. Droplet transmission is when you transmit microbes through microscopic mucus droplets. So let's use the same example disease and talk about how we can spread the same disease into three different methods of contact transmission. If we think about the flu, how can we spread the flu through direct contact? If I have the flu and I give you a kiss, we have now spread that disease from my mouth directly to yours. That's direct contact. If I have the flu and I drink out of a glass of water, and then you drink out of the same glass, then that glass has become the fomite, the inanimate object that is transmitting the flu from me to you. If I sneeze into a Kleenex, and then you pick up the Kleenex and spread the disease that way, the Kleenex has become the fomite. If instead of using a Kleenex, I sneeze directly into your face, I have not contacted, came in contact directly with you, but my mucus has. So that's going to be droplet transmission. Vehicle transmission is when you spread a disease through a media such as water, food, air, or blood. Examples of this would be drinking bad water and you get cholera, eating um, some bad food and you get some sort of gastroenteritis, like a diarrhea type disease. You could inhale some pathogen through the air that's blowing from one city to another. Blood and needles are the tricky ones. It's hard to fit them into a category. If the blood inside of a needle itself is what gets you sick, that is considered vehicle. But if there's no blood left in the needle and just the needle is what transmits the disease, then the needle goes back up here and becomes indirect contact. The needle itself is a fomite. Vector transmission is when you spread an infection from one person to another using a vector. A vector is going to be some sort of bug that can move the pathogen. So a mosquito biting you, that is going to be a disease spread by vector transmission. So I have some pictures we can look at to see some different examples. In this picture we have direct contact. What they're wanting you to see is that these two people are touching hands, so they are spreading infection that way. But there are some examples of other things going on here as well. These people are laughing, they may sneeze, something may go on, so you could actually get droplet going on in this example. Although this picture down here is a freeze frame of a sneeze showing you just how many droplet particles come out by an unprotected sneeze. In our first picture we have food, we have water, so that could be vehicle. We have a glass. That could be a fomite. This picture down here shows you some of the most common fomites that allow diseases to transmit by indirect transmission. We have glasses of water, Kleenexes, thermometers, medicine bottles. Just think about it. When's the last time you went to your little medicine container in your bathroom? 
Were you sick? You probably were. So you probably left some of the disease, some of the infection on those materials. This picture is showing you some of the other methods. A, B, and C are all vehicle. A is being spread by water. B is being spread by food. What's really wrong with this picture? They're cutting on a wooden cutting board. You should never cut chicken or pork or anything like that on a meat on a wooden cutting board because you cannot clean it. It's porous. This guy right here for some reason is sweeping the dirt. So he is spreading anything that's in the dirt into the air. This last example here, this looks like a nice hamburger that has a fly landing on it. That fly is not going to bite you, but that fly could actually be carrying something pathogenic on its feet. And even that's going to be vector because the fly itself is what's transmitting the disease. One of our last terms in this section is the term nosocomial infection. A nosocomial infection is an infection that you obtain once you're in the hospital. This is not something that you had before you went there. There's a few scary statistics we can go over. Even though a hospital is a fairly safe place for you to go, about 20,000 people every year die from a nosocomial infection. This makes it the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. But think about it this way. Who do you think are the people that are dying from the nosocomial infections? These are people that are already extremely sick. They're already very immunocompromised when they go into the hospital itself. Most of your hospital acquired nosocomial infections are going to be acquired when some sort of universal protocol is not followed properly. Most common place we see nosocomial infections are urinary tracts, and this is from catheters being inserted. And it's not necessarily because your nurse does something wrong. It's just a very difficult, delicate procedure to do without getting any sort of infection. After urinary tract, a lot of times we'll see infections occur in surgical wounds. And then next most common would most likely be inhaling something. You know, you just sit in the waiting room and you're waiting for something, and then that really sick person comes and sits next to you and starts sneezing on you. And we all know how we feel about that. Our last term is an emerging infectious disease. And we'll be talking more and more about this term as we start learning about the different, different diseases. Emerging infectious diseases are diseases that are changing. And that is a very scary thing to epidemiologists. A changing disease is going to be a disease that has a very high incidence. Where maybe we weren't seeing it ever or just anymore. We haven't seen it in a while. Then all of a sudden that disease starts creeping up. We see more and more and more of it. Once it becomes an emerging infectious disease, it becomes a disease that we all need to be aware of so that we can know how to prevent it. The most common reason for diseases moving on to this emerging infectious disease list is people not keeping their vaccinations up to date. If you don't get your booster shots, you don't get your vaccines, you begin to lose some of your immunity that that vaccine produced you can then become a carrier. An example would be whooping cough. You may not actually have whooping cough. You may not have the disease, but you're infected. You are carrying the bacteria. It's called Bordetella pertussis. The reason this has made it on the emerging infectious disease list, a lot of babies started dying because their mothers had not been vaccinated. So without knowing it, the mothers were carrying a bacteria that when the baby got around their mother, the baby was then getting a disease that could lead to their death. Very, very scary, simply because we got lazy as a country and we stopped vaccinating people once they reached generally about college age. Another reason that we're seeing some emerging infectious diseases is illegal immigration. Some things like um, Chagas disease, this used to be a disease that we never saw outside of South America. But as we're having more and more illegal immigration occur, sometimes these things, these diseases are coming with them. And we're not talking about somebody that immigrates legally. This is someone that is coming into the country in, a, in the wrong manner. So all of the protocols are not followed. 
we are going to discuss all these different diseases as we move on in the semester. But for now, I want you to understand simply what the term means. Again, an emerging infectious disease is something that is now changing, so we have to be concerned. I highly recommend that for Chapter 14, you go through, write you down a definition of every term, and make sure you understand why we use that terminology at what point.